What's up, everyone? Alex Gore here with CultivatedChange.com. This is going to be a personal one. I'm not real educational, but I'm hoping this will connect with a couple people. Uh, we are actually in a field next to my house, and I never take advantage of just the raw beauty that spring brings. There's a beautiful blooming tree behind me. It's next to a stream bank. And it's right next to my house. I never come out here because it's right next to my house and it's associated with all of the different pitfalls, chores, to-dos, and lists that circle around my brain and probably your brain if you're around your house. So even just being this close and thinking about things that have to go on in the garden, um, projects I'm working on, just the busy, busy chatter, chatter. This one's going to be on the journey to know yourself. Uh, as you know, I'm involved in a project with my roommate called the Syncretist Society. I point it out all the time. It's, it's actually helping me quite a bit to start to dig a little deeper in my own introspection and figure out where I need to get better at, what keeps surfacing in my life, reminding me where my weaknesses are. I know what my strengths are. Most people know what their strengths are. Not a ton of people are willing to work on their weaknesses, myself included. So in this one, we're going to go over the journey to know yourself. And a train just passed about 30 seconds before I hit the, uh, the record button. So good timing on that one. But <clears throat> we might go out to Bent Creek a little later, and I want to do a true decompression uh, mini meditation session with you guys. Meditation has played a huge role in getting me out of some sticky situations, uh, namely clinical depression. When I was 18, my freshman year of college and I was away from home, uh, there was probably some nu nutritional deficiencies involved there as well, but set and setting and, and uh, just your environment cannot be understated or overstated enough in the role that it plays towards your biology reacting. So even, even if you are capable of doing miraculous things, if you're in a rough environment and your biology is fighting every day just to cope with the toxicity and trauma and anything that that you have to deal with that <clears throat> you are unfamiliar with that is a stressor so there's a certain amount of energetic exchange there but um, meditation has played a massive role in in helping me in my life and <clears throat> this tends to happen apologize if my voice is a little harsh this is what this video is about um, whenever I'm sick or whenever I go too hard and I find this happens to productive people, so just people who have a lot on their list or who are not satisfied until they have a lot on the list and they're doing a lot every day. A lot of conditioning there from, from youth probably or um, potentially from making your way through life and finding that you get rewarded or accolades if you are that type of person, even if you're not supposed to be. Uh, and why I mentioned the podcast with with Danielle earlier, Syncretist Society was the, the hardest thing in life, in my life especially, is truly knowing yourself. And it takes years and it's taken me a decade just to start to scratch the surface. I thought I knew when I went to Hawaii and started farming, that was an introduction because that environment lends itself for you to slow down. There's not so much to do to satisfy your basic needs. Uh, I was wolfing in Hawaii, worldwide opportunities on organic farms. If you've never done something like that, just gone and sort of learned about yourself and learned a skill, and you've always wanted to, and you have a few resources to, to throw at three or six months, I would encourage you to do that. That was probably one of the best experiences I've ever had. Uh, I'll put the website below, www zero or www.oof.org, Worldwide Opportunities on Organic Farms. You don't have to be farming, but that's how I learned how to farm. And the people you meet there 
are usually on the same journey. They're usually trying to get to know themselves better. So that was invaluable, but it's taken me a decade since coming back from that and sort of reestablishing how I'm going to get my basic needs met for me to realize that <clears throat> my weaknesses are slowing down. So my type as, a, as Danielle and I have constant discussions about is a projector. <clears throat> it doesn't need to mean much to you. Basically it just means that I take a lot of recovery time and I am energetically sensitive, which just means everything I do costs energy for me, as in just having to have a conversation with someone, um, having to broker different social dynamics between friends. Um, if I'm not just doing this, sitting under a tree, and even this because my mind latches onto projects, traffic going by, uh, things I said I would do, all of that takes energy. Even if it's not physical energy, a lot of that energetic mental and emotional energy uh, is the brunt of my caloric consumption. So probably, I don't know, 75% of my day is mental energy. And I tend to get pissed at myself because I was raised by a very, very working class mother, amazing person, landscaper, and she has the stamina of a workhorse. She can just go from uh, eight o'clock till sundown in the spring and summer. She just goes. So she instilled that in me. So I've carried that up till now. And every time I get tired, whenever the sunset happens, or just even if I haven't done physical, manual, strenuous labor that day, my judgy uh, part, the my mother part of my brain comes out and goes, yeah, you haven't done a lot today. You shouldn't be tired. Just push through it. And probably a lot of people have that where that work ethic was instilled in them. That might work for some people. It doesn't for me anymore. And it has become viciously obvious where <clears throat> I can cope with that as long as my sleep is on point. But as soon as that starts getting shaky or my nutrition starts getting shaky or there's just too much going on and add some stimulants into that. So I got some nice um, coffee here, or rather this is not coffee, this is mud water. I bad mouthed them when I initially tried it. <clears throat> I'll put the link below, not an affiliate. M-U-D slash W-T-R. Basically it's, it was started by a dude who went to, to India and had an addiction to caffeine, like most people do, but coffee specifically. And, <clears throat> you just end up tanking your adrenal system. You guys know this, knows this if you've been following me for any uh, period of time. My, my stimulant need for my go, go, go is a serious issue which will basically kick me in the butt every three weeks so I can rely on stimulants and everything to just get me through my days because my days are kind of crazy. Usually it's like training first thing in the morning at like 6.30 uh, in the gym with client followed by either working at Lotus or gardening or delivering compost or uh, making new beds or uh, podcasting, video editing. My days are all over the place. Always interesting, definitely not complaining, but everything saps energy. So this is masala chai with some cacao and some herbs. You could basically make it yourself, but it's, it's pretty good and balanced, so um, stimulants is a massive problem for productive people, and especially for me, my type, where I need a ton of recovery time, I'm just yo-yoing my adrenal glands all the time. So today is actually, <clears throat> I committed to not having coffee. Until my adrenal system comes back online, Probably in a month I'll give myself that opportunity, but this is just a masala chai with some cacao and a little um, coconut cream. Pretty good, mild. So that's a good uh, replacement for coffee if you still, you know, you don't want to deal with the caffeine withdrawal, which is a very real thing. Anyway, off topic. Every about three weeks I get sick. Sick meaning my body 
forces me to stomp. <clears throat> I will get a sore throat, not because I caught anything or because of an infection, because of my adrenal fatigue. Because it happens on a fairly regular pattern and it's, I go hard for about three weeks and then my body just hits me with extreme amounts of fatigue, sore throat and a bit of a temperature and lethargy is the first sign. This eyelid will start twitching like it is right now, which basically just means my cortisol levels and my adrenaline are maxed and my hormones are nowhere near balanced. And then I get to take a day or two or three and just work at subpar operating levels to my standards to get back up to normal operating speed. And it's taken maybe a year since I've been working for myself to actually realize that. So this is why coaches need coaches, because if someone else was doing that, I would be you know, pointing out the obvious, but it's hard for me to let myself slow down because you know, when you have a business, you have to just be going all the time. Your work never really ends. There's no office that you can just disconnect from. Uh, until now, so there there needs to be. There needs to be a clear disconnect. So I've asked my roommate to, uh, to stop coffee with me because she's she has that issue as well. And we have ceremonial grade cacao in the house, so no need for coffee at all. Today, um, I'm gonna do a little ritual this evening and that'll be an entirely different video on the necessity and missing link of ritual. Cultures have had that forever, just to solidify a formal change, communicate your conscious mind to your subconscious saying, this is a serious thing, this is happening. We don't have that anymore, but I'm gonna bring it back. So I'm going to do a, <clears throat> um, I gave my personal training clients a, a 21 day challenge because none of them can make it in the gym every day. So I gave them a uh, primal essential movements challenge built into my coaching programs, which is, uh, if you can't make it in the gym, you either need to do 100 squats or 100 push-ups or 100 rows, and those will start stacking as time progresses. But I can't do that because I'm way too active anyway, and that would kill me. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to do a 21-day fire and meditation challenge. And what that means is I'm going to have a dedicated period, 20 to 30 minutes, a day where I do this. It can be midday, it can be in the evening, but I need to have some serious decompression time where I have nothing to do. It's quiet. Hopefully some Shinrin Yoku, which is what this is. This is close to forest bathing. And uh, basically just time to decompress and review my day and tune back into my body because I haven't been listening to it as I tell other people to. All my ancestral coaching programs basically train people to pay attention to and listen to their body, but of course, uh, do as I say, not as I do. So I'm t I've been terrible at doing it because spring just usually energizes me and there's so much to do, especially in the garden. But um, based on my type, I'm a projector. My body cannot physically handle the amount of things I'm asking it to do energetically, calorically, uh, especially if I am you know, want to throw some metabolic health in there and I know the power of intermittent fasting. Doing that much on two meals a day to try to get a lot of that cleanup mechanism uh, internally hasn't been working well. So I will get a sore throat because my type is a uh, self-projected projector, meaning <clears throat> I am able to decipher what is right for me by hearing myself speak out loud. And what this means is if I talk too much, like right now, I will get a sore throat eventually because that is where my body reflects back to me how balanced I am. So I'll get a sore throat whenever I'm out of balance. And usually it's because I've been chatting too much or talking too much. <clears throat> and that's just a metaphor for the amount of energy I'm expending. I tend to be talkative, which actually shouldn't be the case. I should be more of a listening and then reflecting when it's pulled out of me or specifically requested. All this to say, I'm starting a um, no coffee kick for at least 21 days tonight. I'm gonna have a fire, I'm gonna put that intention and 
burn it to start off that ritual and I'm going to catalog that challenge and the uh, meditation challenge just to hold myself accountable because that is the hardest part for everyone, coaches included, there's no difference. <clears throat> it's always easier to objectively see what someone else could do. So I need to film myself so I can go back and reflect and review on what I did poorly. And that is my weakness. My weakness is slowing down, saying no, because I tend to grasp or go with any opportunity uh, and not move as much. My lifestyle basically runs my metabolism and I move a ton. So that's, you know, other people might benefit from moving a little more in their life, maybe based off their type, but uh, I am not one of those. I move plenty, so I actually need to do more of this. Sorry about the rant, but hopefully this has helped some people. The point of this whole thing was if you find yourself constantly being reminded by your body that you are not in balance and you will get back in balance for a couple days until things return to normal and then immediately go back to your old state, what would you need to change? What would you need to commit to? How would you need to solidify that process? What sorts of conditioning would you need to overcome? Would you need to go through your relationship with expectations from society, culture, parents, family, friends, spouse, or significant other? <clears throat> your body doesn't care about your commitments or what you've said or what people expect of you. If it's not right for you, you will be reminded. A lot of people have this show up with autoimmune disease. A lot of my fellow classmates uh, in um, Primal Health Coach Institute dealt with far more severe things than adrenal fatigue, which is what I deal with. A lot of autoimmune disease, a lot of Hajimoto's, a lot of psoriasis, a lot of inflammatory based diseases. And the, the way you deal with that, that works for most people, is an ancestral diet, which basically just cuts out almost everything other than the bare essentials. And that is what I have to do. I have to cut out, not nutrition wise, I have to cut out <clears throat> everything that's not essential to me, to my well-being in the moment, to get back to balance and then hold it there. The problem for most people is holding it there. Most people can do a 21 day challenge because you commit to it, but it's after that. It's reintegrating all of the most critical practices you learn about yourself, about your body, about how you interact with the world in that process, <clears throat> and then moving it back into your busy, productive work life. And that's, that's what my coaching programs are for. If any of this resonated with you, feel free to check out my coaching programs. They're all below. But I'll be cataloging my journey towards decompression, moving less and being more present and specifically carving out downtime. Most people need to specifically carve out active time or wor uh, uh, workout time or productive time. I need to do the opposite. I need to carve out leisure, mindfulness, meditation, and just getting out into the nature, into the woods a little more. We're gonna go out into the woods after this. Uh, we'll have a little brief meditation. Apologize for the, the rant, but uh, I hope this resonated some of it with someone out there who's dealing with the same issue or opposing issues and have been going through trying to figure out patterns in their own life and, and what their body is telling them is, is now necessary in their stage of life. Thanks for listening. Let's go out into the woods. <clears throat> in meditation, when you're first learning, the concept is generally quiet and stillness. And that does come for sure and helps. But if you're just busy and you're having trouble just watching things pop up in your mind, vibration has been extremely useful for me. And what I mean is the sound of running water or a constant hum of something in the background. Something for your brain to attach to so that it has something to do per se and it'll part of your conscious mind will latch onto that 
so you can focus on whatever you need to focus on, if that's your breath or vibration. For me, the basic form of a mantra helps ginormously. And this is why a lot of meditation music you'll find uses a gong. Reality is... And we won't give it a name. Too, so you can focus on sort of bringing the stillness within you outside. For me, uh, it's the traditional meditative sound, which is Sanskrit A-U-M, and that's the OM. It's usually written O-M, it's A-U-M, and <clears throat> it's called the pranava. It represents all sound, and I didn't know this until maybe a year ago, and I should have, meaning <clears throat> it represents all sound in creation because it goes from the back of your throat forward. So when you make the sound A-U-M, it's So starts here and works its way up. And whenever I first learned that, I was like, there's nothing magical about that. It's just you humming. But if you flip that, it's the entirety of sound that you can make, which means it's the entirety of sound. It's a, it's a weird mind flip, but it does help me to focus on it because it creates a vibration in my body and that resonance sort of creates a field for me that I can feel. It helps me focus on my breath and because of that I start to feel different parts of my body. So we'll just do it once more and I'll tell you what comes up. And it's amazing just that, how much things slow down. If you're able to do that for even 45 seconds, my brain slows down extremely quickly and the duration of my breaths change quickly. Like within minutes, my a usual 30 to 45 second breath might turn into a minute to a minute and a half breath. And just the amount of oxygen you're holding in your lungs and your diaphragm change dramatically and you'll be able to tell pretty quickly if you're anxious if you're breathing through your upper chest or if you're you're actually diaphragm breathing and belly breathing has been one of the most drastic changes for me that has affected my anxiety levels it's much easier to do outside especially if you've been at walking a little bit and if you don't have any like pressing deadlines that are just itching at you but even then, it's a good strategy to be able to overcome that. Point being, don't underestimate the power of vibration for affecting your mood, your energetic state, your cognition, your sleep, everything. If you don't feel comfortable making a sound yourself, I found a gong to be extremely, extremely powerful because it's extremely close to that same OM sound. And the difference between OM to me and OM really getting down here is different. If I try to say OM, oh, my mouth is already shrunken. If I try to say AUM, OM, there's, I can feel the difference in where it's coming from in my throat. And that makes all the difference to me. So play with whatever vibration you're easily able to attach to and helps you 
work your way into the stillness. I'm just starting getting back into serious breath work, making it a disciplined part of my day, especially in the morning, especially in the evening whenever I'm winding down. And I played with yoga and dipped into Kundalini whenever I was in my early 20s, but that is becoming apparent that I need to come back into that as my introspective practices pick back up. So I'll be playing with Kundalini practices and seeing what comes up and what struggles it reveals and hopefully presenting that in some coherent fashion to you guys. Thanks for listening to The Rant. Talk to you next time.